ladies. I hope you're all doing well and enjoying your home and you have great plans for its improvement. And if you're new here or if you haven't done it yet, please click the link in the description box and go to the place on which I have embedded this. Also on the channel on YouTube, please uh, hit subscribe and ring the bell because the bell will make sure that you are notified when a new video has been done. And when a new video is up, I also try to have it on a page on a post on the blog so that way you'll know my blog is updated and it includes the video and a lot of other things that I have spoken about that I can't do on a video. And so today we want to start out with preparation if uh, you're preparing for taking care of your home and also I wanted to tell you I know the lighting is bad here. This is early in the morning and uh, but the important thing is that you can hear me because this is a work as you listen type of broadcast and so if you are wanting to get healthier I have a few things today to talk to you about that I have learned this week and uh, I'm just uh, delighted with it and also to if you are struggling with your homemaking or struggling with learning something new or just with uh, just with focus or life itself then ask God to help you uh, to live a dignified uh, life and try to um, try to adapt your personality to natural things and don't be also avoid if you want to be taken seriously at home uh, don't be uh, flippant silly mis mischievous or always witty it's okay to have some wry wit once in a while but if you find that people are not taking you seriously and not that we want to be we're concerned about that we just like to get our job done but if you find that uh, there's something that is amiss and people are treating you in a way that is not dignified then you really need to check on yourself first of course you know there's always the stinkers that are out there that are going to say something against you but uh, always watch yourself first so this is a this is a learning curve for uh for character for yourself not for everybody out there even though i like to have a little fun with the people in the at the end of the video the ones you get sometimes and, and the things that they do and uh, but it's really about ourselves it's really about taking care of ourselves and our own personalities and it is amazing how people can form an opinion of you as a homemaker so quickly without knowing you without knowing what you do and uh, they can catch you at a uh, a very bad moment when you're not really um, focused very well in your home or something something is falling apart and they'll make a judgment and they'll say well she's not uh, she's not all there she's not she's not organized or they'll catch you uh, when you have just come in from a trip or when you have been sick and uh, make a, an opinion about you so that's why it's very important to be as serious as you can at, without being dour and sour and it's a quite a balance not uh, to be so uh, fun loving that people forget that you are have a serious side and that you are serious about homemaking and so I have heard some young men say that they don't want their wives home being a homemaker because they can't do it or that they uh, aren't capable of it or they're not uh, serious enough about it and uh, so we could take we could take that to heart but we can always prove people wrong can't we because we learn it's a learning thing it, you learn as you go anyone that's starting out any kind of new job goes into a learner's mode and learns and uh, so this is what we're doing is we're learning how to manage the home and to make it a pleasant place for other people but you can avoid uh, a lot of the a lot of the clueless remarks if you behave in a dignified manner and one of the things that begins with is the way you take care of your appearance first thing in the day and Helen Andelin described it in her book as a, a cotton house dress however I don't look at them as house dresses they're it's beautiful clothing and the cotton of course is the easiest to work in because it's washable and it uh, also is very very comfortable 
And a homemaker is there also to bring refinement and beauty to the home. You know, the Bible talks about refinement, and there's one one time I saw the word refine. And I believe it was in the Old Testament where it said talked about the coming of Christ. It says, He shall purify the sons of Levi. And purify. I had a class once where I brought some crude oil. That's the only thing I could think of. But you could also get uh, some kind of oil like olive oil before it's been filtered or and then another jar of oil that has been filtered and you just show them the difference between it and so show them the difference between uh, what what refined and unrefined is or you could get a little silver like a spoon and a polishing cloth and uh, you could pass it around if someone wanted a, a, a lesson like that in fact I'm thinking of doing it with my ladies class you get a tarnished piece of silver or anything you pass it around with the polishing cloth and you get them to polish it while you talk about refinement refinement just means taking away the dross you can look that word up uh, now that you're being homeschooled by me you can look up the word dross d-r-o-s-s -S. you take away the dross you take away the unrefined particles the dirt the unnecessary parts and reveal the shiny purity of whatever it is that you are cleaning and so this is one thing that I'm going to be doing sometime soon I used to do it with little girls when we had a little girls class and to show what refined meant uh, it's hard to connect sometimes but it's just the difference between um, being careless in in the way you take care of yourself and being careful that's really all it is and it's the difference between being clean and not so clean and it's a difference between being um, thoughtful of others in the way you smell or the way you and I, and I always go for a clean smell I don't like perfumes I don't like the the dryer sheets I don't like the uh, water softeners I use vinegar because the smell goes away and it has the same effect I don't even use detergents and um, because everybody complains about uh, itching and smell and everything we've gotten where we've, we've been so inundated with those smells might not uh, bother you we don't use plug-ins or anything like that and um, so now that brings me to my my next uh, because that's uh, those scents are not they're just a cover-up they're not natural they're just a cover-up for maybe something that's not pure not clean and uh, you can't do that for, you can only do that for so long and it'll only, it'll smell worse and it starts to affect you and you become allergic to it so so I wanted to tell you about something that I have learned recently you know I've been talking to you occasionally about flowers and I was recently talking to a friend of mine who had been in the hospital and she was she had some serious serious illness and surgery and she was told she would have to be there three weeks. And uh, her friends and relatives and family flooded her room with flowers and bouquets. And she was out in five days. And I wonder if maybe the hospital just wanted her gone because of, she turned her room into a florist shop or what. But she was, uh, and, and all the flowers went with her. But uh, I've been talking to a friend who said that people recover faster from any illness even if you're just at home in bed with a little cold or a little trifling cold <laughs> nonsense people do not die of trifling colds but we don't know and um, and a, a bouquet of flowers is very very helpful and uh, so next time your mother gets sick you children make sure you go and uh, order some flowers on the on your phone and have them delivered to the door and uh, uh, or you can get someone to take you to the grocery store, get a bouquet, and split it all up and cut it and put it in different uh, containers. Now, I have a container back here and two over there, and they're all small, and I split up that bouquet I got at the grocery store. It was hydrangeas and miniature roses, and I split it all up into ten little jars and put them in every room of the house and sometimes two or three because some rooms are more than one room once the foyer combined with the living room combined with uh, a, a, a little eating area and so I have a, a tiny bouquet in every room and I'll read to you what I learned about it and this little this little vase comes from the Dollar Tree 
and there was only one and it has a little metal leaf on it and I wanted to warn you when you're buying vases you see these at Goodwill sometimes tiny vases and maybe you wonder what people use them for I know they use them for weddings and stuff but when you buy something like this make sure that the opening is very wide I got rid of everything that was too small that someone's finger could get stuck in because one time one of my children picked up a couple of jars to move them and we were going to wash them and everything and got her got her finger stuck in a very small area we had quite a time getting uh, that loosened and uh, but we did and we learned a lesson learned a great lesson and I have been outside picking Queen Anne's lace and found some that were pink now these were growing in gravel so Queen Anne's lace loves the minerals of gravel and I found some that had turned pink so there must be a mineral there that is turning them pink anyway I was uh, thinking about these little vases or vases because I was wondering you see them a lot in your thrift stores and in goodwills and they maybe have been bought for an occasion and then abandoned but uh, also if you start watching they, they're very historically correct in some of these period movies but they know they have to because there are people that watch every every little detail of it and know whether or not it's accurate if it's historically accurate and I had an old uh, I believe it was the Margaret Sangster book uh, that I was reading to you about the girl of 15 and she had in there a chapter on how to uh, make find out how to make or how to make uh, artificial flowers but uh, the things that I ha and of course we've had artificial flowers around here they get to looking old and after a while and uh, they're not as effective uh, for your health they're nice to look at but they don't have the same effect as real flowers so what you do is you go to the grocery store and you get one bouquet that's fairly inexpensive and uh, or one or two of the same and mix them in there if they're not you know m most of the time they're under ten dollars but so I have I've got them all over now and I just was testing this out because I'm a scientist you know and so be a scientist of your home and uh, test this out previously I was not inclined to do this because uh, it was I was trying to cut down on the amount of work that I have to do and when you have to go gather them all up and when they die <laughs> either dry them or throw them out and then clean the vases so I had not I had been avoiding doing that but recently I've become more interested in it and had a memory of my 16th birthday my mother had a florist give me uh, she bought from a florist uh, the, my first bouquet of flowers most beautiful thing I had ever experienced or it was just amazing light pink roses and baby's breath which was popular in the late 1950s early 1960s and uh, the effect that it had on me was just this oh so special feeling that I don't think I've ever had so much since that first time and also I was in the hospital with uh, my the birth of my children and someone gave me a beautiful bouquet in a little porcelain or uh, ceramic bassinet which I I don't know where that best I always save everything but I can't find that anywhere it could be that it broke and I got rid of it but uh, the effect that it had on me and to go home and there were flowers at home too was very special and Mr. Andolin wrote a book uh, Man of Steel and Velvet and he had a section on there now whether you agree with anything they wrote uh, I just like to put that aside I don't agree with everything either but uh, some of the things they wrote were very practical and he had a whole page or two on fresh flowers and why these were so important uh, to give to your wife and one of them was that they represented a beauty and a delicacy that we attribute to women and that's why I emphasize to become as refined, refined in your speech, refined in your voice, refined in the way you dress, refined in the way that you uh, conduct yourself and uh, move and just refined in your opinion and, and uh, look up that word refined and learn what it means. It means to discard that which is crude or rude or unnecessary and and that these to be like uh, these flowers would mean that you would be soft 
and you would be sweet and you would be uh, you would have beauty and color and uh, oh just many I can't tell you all the attributes so I'm going to read some of it to you uh, and show you again this little this little uh, bouquet I should have had something in here to set it on and uh, so you don't have to spend a lot and if you watch the old movies you know the old period movies even the ones in the 19, in the 1990s the beautiful uh, Jane Austen movies and uh, pri uh, Wives and Daughters and uh, North and South uh, the BBC production they were careful to have flowers and even Molly walked into a room and uh, the dining table was set with a beautiful bouquet and she walked past very preoccupied and she stopped and looked and she said what beautiful flowers I wish I had a screenshot of those beautiful flowers that were probably real and if you've ever been to an open house for a uh, historic building or some kind of historic house tour you will notice they do use real flowers and I used to go to those avidly uh, when I was younger I just loved them couldn't get enough of these historic houses and wondered why they bothered to buy real flowers for for the all the tables all the bedrooms everywhere you looked there was a bouquet of flowers but the more I read about them and the more this lady talked to me about about the effect of flowers the more convinced I've become uh, of their importance and I have another friend no matter how uh, bad her life gets and how poor she gets she always manages to have flowers and a lady that I met in Australia when I was there for a while she was a widow but every month or two she would go to a florist and get lilies because she liked them so much and they filled her house and the smell was really nice and uh, I always wondered why did she do that they're just going to die she's just going to throw them out clean out the jar and all that but the more I read about it, the more I see the purpose in it. Plus, if you're a homemaker, this gets you moving around and puttering around or pottering, as they say, moving around, uh, moving little things and situating everything. And uh, I am anxious to know how my uh, descendants are going to feel when they come back and find that every room has fresh flowers. And my friend that was telling me about this says she even puts them in the bathroom. So this is interesting and also in the kitchen is she'll clean off the kitchen, clean off the tops of all the surfaces and then put a fresh bouquet of flowers by the sink. Very interesting. So now I'm going to read you what I found uh, that you might like and this was called Four Reasons um, by the FloraQueen.com Four Reasons You Should Have Fresh Flowers at Home. Now ladies, like Victoria Magazine this is one of the homemakers helpers that you need to have this is essential this is an essential just like uh, Victoria and tea time and uh, it it doesn't seem like it if you get too practical then you'll say well uh, you know you're just wasting your money you have to throw it away well we do the same thing with food don't we don't we try to get the best and most beautiful food do we say of a uh, a beautiful uh, ripe piece of uh, fresh food in the uh, in the fresh fresh department oh it, it it looks really nice and it smells really nice but it's a waste of waste of money because we're just going to eat it so you look at flowers as part of your groceries okay four reasons you should have fresh flowers at home flowers are great aren't they they make a fabulous gift you know that's another thing um, that they make a gift that suits everyone uh, every now and then you'll meet somebody who's ter terribly allergic to them and it could be the things that they spray on them at the florist but it's possible that you could substitute for that but most for most people uh, even if they are allergic to them they can be set outside on their porch and uh, they're just the perfect gift and there's something they don't have to keep sometimes as you get uh, more vital uh, you there are more things to look after and people want to give you things but the flowers are the absolute best because there's something that will um, have to be replaced with something fresh again they're natural and beautiful and make people smile however there's a lot more these marvels of nature can do for you and your home so we're going to tell you four great reasons why you should keep fresh flowers in your house 
This is just such good news, ladies. This is the best news there is. And if you are in a growing area, and here's the problem. I have uh, flower beds surrounding the manse outside. And I don't pick those and put them in vases because that's part of my landscape. And I want to see that burst of color around my house. And I don't want them all picked. However, when the descendants come, I let them I let them pick them. You can't, even those will fade. So, uh, if you don't want to pick the ones in your flower bed, what you do is you just grow a little plot somewhere else or even in a, uh, a container of stuff that you plan on picking, things that you can pick. Uh, they call it a cutting garden. Okay, take a look at our four reasons you should have fresh flowers at home and see if you can take advantage of any of the amazing benefits. Number one, flowers clean the air. See, you don't need all those uh, plug-ins with all that uh, artificial scent. Um, they'll say that there's an essential oil in them, but they have other things in them too. Um, and, I, and I don't object to essential oils. However, it can be pretty strong. and. Uh, not everybody wants to uh, have a, have them around, especially around little children. So uh, it goes it goes without saying that flowers improve the smell in a room. But did you, did you know that some flowering plants can actually filter and clean the air of that room too? Uh, and I will put the link on the page so that you can go look those up the the plants that actually clear and that would be the more practical solution to those of you who object to cut bouquets because they just die you have to throw them out is to get a flowering plant in your house so she lists some of them peace lilies gerberas bromelias according to studies can help to remove harmful toxins from the air and can even improve a night's rest very interesting all you people that have uh, sleep disorders. Very interesting. As they give off large amounts of oxygen, so it's not only what they look that they look fresh, they actually freshen the air as well. In addition to that, the flowers that people often choose for their scents, such as roses, help improve people's mood and maintain a relaxed atmosphere thanks to their aroma therapy powers. Now, this is uh i i really think that having flowers if you've had a a rough day if there's been disagreements if there's been uh, any kind of upset to your to your mind and you're finding it hard to uh, be happy or to concentrate at home and maybe you have a difficult family member uh that you're looking after or is part of the immediate family these flowers apparently can alleviate a lot of the mental stress that this causes, that these people are causing. Um, and also, I have warned you about the media. We have enough stress, don't we, with our, um, some of us, <laughs> some people uh, explain to me that they have enough stress with their families that they don't really need the news because it's it's just as much trauma, so they just uh, so they just listen to their relatives or friends, and uh, there's there's enough of the same kind of trauma, so they don't have to listen to the the mainstream media. So uh, flowers number two. Now number one was clean the air. Number two, flowers brighten up a room and your mood too. Oh, isn't that great? You know, and God made them. And this is even uh, better news than any kind of scent you can bring into your home. You know, I'm crazy about scented candles, but for some reason, be when I became vital, I I started to get very sick smelling anything, uh, any scent, anything scented except the flowers. It's no exaggeration to say that a little color can go a long way. Placing flowers around a room where you can see them even has the ability to make your mood better and also to help you connect better with other people. Ah, some of you that are uh, what they call antisocial, <laughs> you just need flowers. <laughs> it says, a study, uh mentions this certain study, and I'll just link everything so you can go read it yourself. 
noted that the participants who had placed flowers around their homes in locations where they could be seen on a day-to-day -day basis. That's why I say, you know, even uh, at the end of a hall, maybe not if you if you hide them in all the rooms, but you don't really see them unless you go in that room. It's not as effective as if at the end of the hall you put a little table or something to stand some flowers or a flowering plant on, even in a bookshelf or some place that you see. And uh, so all around, you have to be able to see them. Uh, those who had placed flowers around their homes in locations where they could be seen on a day-to-day -day basis experienced a noticeable increase in their mood as well as a higher compassion towards other people. Oh, isn't that what we need? Higher compassion towards other people. If only I had known this, when there was any kind of a family tension or some kind of uh, upsetting news, if only I had thought to bring home flowers. Now, of course, I can go out and pick them here, uh, but the beauty of uh, some of the hothouse flowers is that they have, uh, they're not going to have the little bugs crawling on them <laughs> and landing on your table. However, uh, whatever you, you do, it doesn't matter where you get them, uh, just as long as you're happy with the results. If you feel like a room in your home is a magnet for negative energy, that's interesting. Uh, and I've talked to you about uh, weather and Eric Sloan's weather book and how there's an atmospheric weather. Uh, if you feel like a room in your home is a magnet for negative energy, perhaps a carefully placed bouquet of lilies could help. You know, we could do that. We could do that. You could even do that in your uh, church assembly, wherever you worship. Uh, bring some fresh flowers. <clears throat> Flowers number three. So number one was uh, clean the air. They clean the air. Number two was they brighten up a room and your mood too. And number three was flowers can complement your interior design. The great thing about flowers is that they come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. They're the perfect way to complement your new household designs or to help rethink the internal look of your home. It's also really easy to choose flowers to match different personalities depending on the type of preference and styles that you're trying to achieve. Yes. So uh, on your child's birthday, bring them flowers it's, and, and choose ones that you know, I like to just do my own bouquet. I'll go to the grocery store or Walmart and get several kinds and pick them up and uh, and then s put them in assorted vases in the uh, with the different ones the way I want them. In addition to this, flowers are super easy to corp incorporate into design features in your home, such as light fittings and ornaments, if you are feeling adventurous with them. Also remember, they serve pretty well for ornamental purposes themselves. Yes, and seasonally too. You get your autumn colors, you get your spring colors, you get your winter colors, and uh, they just so complement the home. and. There is something very ennobling, you know, I told you to try to behave in a dignified way at home, to be, uh, to be able to see the importance of your job and also to be treated uh, a little more seriously, that arranging and placing these flowers does something to your, uh, to your heart and your mind. So number four. Flowers make you feel and think better. Now, as you get more vital, you really need this, don't you? Make you feel and think better. We all know that flowers for a sick relative have, have a positive effect. However, did you know that there were physiological effects too? You think about uh, physical therapy, physical. According uh to a study, and she mentions the study, and I will put that there for you. Flowers could even lower blood pressure, reduce feelings of pain and anxiety, as well as help with fatigue. Look at that. The view of flowers in your home can help you to physically de-stress and ease into relaxation better. As if that wasn't enough, they're a great help if you're studying or preparing for a big project. And uh, they can improve your cognitive performance if they are present in your workspace. Well, for some of you that have a hard time sitting down and getting your list ready or 
paying attention to the things you have to, the bills you have to pay at your desk or the letters that you write might need a bouquet of flowers right there. It's amazing what a simple bunch of flowers can do for your home and your well-being. All it takes is a vase or vase, a well-chosen bouquet, and a little bit of water. Now I put a little bit of uh, soda bicarb in the bottom. If you don't have that little packet, you know, uh, preservative, you could just make up your own. You can look that up too. Look up uh, preservatives for fresh flowers and see what you have in your kitchen that would work. And I understand uh, sugar too will help. Uh, so now I'm going to read another one to you. And it's called uh, Health Benefits of Flowers. Six Mental Health Benefits of Plants. Okay, uh, flowers can improve anxiety, stress, and anxiety are part of everyday life. Flowers can help you sleep. They can improve your memory. Flowers can change your emotions with colors, and that's why the Victorians had all these books on the language of flowers, and the white rose was supposed to meet, mean peace, and uh, these colors had a meaning if someone left you uh, certain flowers. Flowers can improve your memory and change your emotions with the colors. Flowers can make you more productive and uh, it has quite a bit of stuff here on six mental health benefits of plants from the plant doctor. And uh, so one of them is they can improve anxiety, which I have read to you about before, and they can help you sleep. Read you that one before. It can improve your memory. Uh, and there's a great article that goes with it. And change your emotions with the colors and make you more productive. Yes, we need them in the home as homemakers, not only for to be pleasing to people around us that are in the home, but for us. Though that's our medicine. That's our that's our um that's our drink. <laughs> and uh so I, I hope that the point has been made. Um, so I want to read another article to you here. And it's called Eight Amazing Benefits of Having Flowers in Your Home. So here it is. Um, they reduce stress. Yes, we've already had that here. Uh, and I believe I have read all eight of them to you so I probably won't repeat that and I will leave you links so that you can go and read a little bit more about them yourself then let's go back to my notes and if you have something to do I hope you'll go do it the light's not good here there's not much to see but I was going to just give you a little health tip that I learned when I was very young. I must have been 16 years old. And it was to, you cut a lemon into several wedges. I cut mine into about eight little wedges and store them in a, con a closed container in the fridge. And every evening and every morning, squeeze the little wedge into some water and then put the whole wedge in there with the rind and everything. Let it set a little while and drink it. You don't have to drink much. Maybe fourth cup. Uh, add about a fourth cup of water. You can have it hot or cold. And uh, to in increase health, balance your body, and I've forgotten what else I was going to say about it. Um, that adds an important uh, probiotic nutrient in your body. And uh, so I just wanted to give you that little and if you if you like tea that can be your tea put it in a special cup and I've been stealth um, sipping and doing tea and was outside admiring the way the sun shines on the side of the manse there even though it looks old and abandoned I set my teacup up there and took a picture of it and the whole idea of it is that nobody knows I'm doing it. I'm not making a big production about, oh, now I'm sitting down and having tea. I'm doing stealth tea and doing it for the exciting locations I can find all around the manse, inside and outside. And uh, I'm enjoying that. I hope you are too. And it just brings out the amount of things that we can do uh, within the home. 
uh, without having to have a lot of gear and expense and having to leave the home. And I talked to several people who had uh, answered my little questionnaire. And if you'd like to answer this, you could just email me. And that was, what do you like? What is the great appeal of the Jane Austen books and movies? And so I will read one that I received today uh, from someone that local people that I text that like Jane Austen. If you would like to send one to me, I'll read that aloud too, if it's nice, if it's refined. <laughs> so it says, Hi Lydia, I really, and this is a um, young single girl, I really enjoy Jane Austen because her stories have such a great moral compass. The people with good morals are happy in the end, and the people without a moral compass are miserable. Her characters grow in maturity throughout the plot. I always liked uh, Elizabeth Gaskell too because she believed in happy endings and towards the end even the characters we didn't like uh, learned some lessons and became easier to get along with. Her heroes and heroines are not unrealistically perfect and her antagonists are not dreadfully horrific. The result being you can sit down with a cup of tea in the afternoon, relax, and enjoy the story peacefully knowing that nothing is going to be so extreme as to break your solitude. That's just beautiful, isn't it? And uh, so I'm going to get some more. Hopefully you can send me some and I will read them. And now I want to read one more. Uh, let me just check my notes here and see what I'm doing here. Uh, I think it's really important for us to remember while, while I'm referring to Jane Austen because we have so many quotes that we have memorized in our family and that is uh, that occasionally people are confused about having had criticism leveled at them and particularly the homemaker you might not uh, I lived in an era where homemakers were um, criticized quite a bit uh, because people were trying to discourage them from being home and wanted them out uh, in the you know in the grind of things out in the world and so criticism was leveled at them many of them were uh, sorrowful because of it and it really broke their hearts but if you remember Lizzie said my courage always rises with every attempt to intimidate me and I remember in the Bible it says Qui in quietness and peace shall be your strength so that's the same as your in, in another verse have courage and I will give you strength so uh, that would be something you could look up is courage and it just means uh, being determined to keep on with something in spite of the backlash of it. And so we have talked about that enough. And I want to read a little bit more about uh, from Helen's book on health. Since I have talked to you a little bit about that lemon drink and alluded to it as one of the starts of the day of good health. So she's talking about health here. A lot of things in her book were very, very practical. And I think uh, people always objected to the part she had on uh, getting along with uh, husbands, which some of it is, is very good. It does not apply to everyone, I, I suppose, uh, particularly those, those whose, uh, whose husbands would not... Uh, would not get along no matter what. Some people are like that, you know, but uh, it's worth a try. And she has in chapter 23, the foundations of health. She said, uh, and, and all through her book, she de-emphasizes beauty and emphasizes character. And uh, she says, it's not as important to be pretty as it is to have good character. And then she includes he health. The foundation of beauty is health not only for the health itself but for the fresh and joyful spirit it lends to the appearance actions and attitude how attractive are sparkling eyes lustrous hair a clear voice buoyancy of manner 
and the animation which brings good health to the face, and the vivacity it communicates to the thoughts. We cannot attach too much importance to this qualification. What is good health? Are we healthy if we never get sick, never have to visit a doctor, or spend time sick bed in sick bed? Are we healthy if we feel reasonably well most of the time? Not necessarily. The sparkling countenance described above is not derived from just average good health. A fresh, radiant appearance appears from health in rich abundance. And certainly those of us who are growing more vital every day want that rich abundance health. We admire it more than beautiful clothing, than rich furnishings, uh, than a state-of-the-art kitchen, and we, we want that the most. And hopefully... Uh, being home will help us get that way because we can prepare our food from natural ingredients and we can learn more about all the elements of good health. It isn't just about eating, it's about sleeping and it's about uh, fresh air and it's about uh, a balanced mental attitude and uh, many, I think there were about six or seven things that that good health was comprised of and yet most people focus on the on the diet part on the eating part I really liked uh, I really liked Brian Kozlowski's book the Jane Austen diet because it covered a lot of those health uh, things it, and not just the eating he only had about one chapter on eating on dining and food and the rest of it were, were was rich with other things including good conversations with people, quiet time, other things like that. So, so uh, what is the secret? It's, so she says, health and rich abundance. So it's not enough just to be alive, just to be healthy. Let's have health and rich abundance. What is the secret of abundant health? Like happiness, health is based on laws. We attain good health by understanding these laws and applying them. The following are the fundamental laws of good health. And I'm thinking of uh, scriptures in the Psalms that talks about uh, laughter being health to your, to your bones or to your, uh, to your heart. And many other things. You might look up the word health in the Bible and see how often it mentions health. And what it mentions health in connection to. Eat properly. Well, of course, she uh, hers are uh, eating and sleeping, exercise, fresh air, water, and of course, water isn't just to drink. There's water to bathe in. There's water uh, for different, a whole lot of different things. Relaxing at work or play, and having a healthy mental attitude. So let me read this to you in the time that I have left. And I'm very sorry about the lighting here, but what's more important? is the message. Uh, by the way, uh, a bookmark that my daughter made me. The foundation, uh, okay, eat properly. A super wholesome diet uh, is in the following. 50% of the more or more of the diet should be comprised of fresh fruits and vegetables. Now she was the first one I read about that said this because all the food companies, all the food processing companies, and all the cereal companies had the pyramid on their label showing uh, the grains being the biggest part. <laughs> but she says 50% should be uh, freshly prepared fruits and vegetables. When possible, buy or grow organic. Now this was written in the 1960s before that became uh, before it became more prevalent and um, unsprayed fruits and vegetables. About 25% or more of the diet should be comprised of grains. About 10% should be uh, legumes and the remaining to 10 to 15 percent can consist of meat, dairy products, oils, and other things used mainly to flavor foods. And when you cook, uh, use tightly covered pans at temperatures below the boiling point of water. Allow considerable additional cooking time. Don't overcook. If you haven't been feeling well, this diet will make a remarkable difference within a few days. If you're already in good health, you'll notice more abundant health than you have thought possible. 
If you don't wish to follow it to such an extreme, use it as a guideline to improve your diet. So foods to avoid, processed foods, and I was told, I think, in this era, in the late 1960s, go around the outer perimeters of your grocery store where all the fresh things are. And then last would be the dried and canned things that you can't get fresh. Avoid all processed or refined foods such as white flour, white sugar, white rice, or foods which contain Tain them, such as macaroni, crackers, cold cereal, cookies. If you ever look up the history of cold cereals, then you never want to touch them again. Um, cold cookies, cakes, pies, donuts, pizza, spaghetti, candy gum, or ice cream. Now, when we want ice cream, we prepare it uh, ourselves with with cream, and uh, we make our own with all without all the guar gums and additives in them. Beware of foods which come in boxes, bottles, cans, or packages. That was quite a struggle uh, getting people to accept that because the older people, uh, I guess from being in depression and the war wars, uh, got used to having things in boxes, bottles, cans, or packages, and it was a hard thing to, to get them to accept me uh, wanting to have things fresh and of course I grew up uh, in Alaska where we had fresh fish and fresh everything that my mother grew too. Avoid canned or frozen food. Avoid cold cuts of meat, ham, bacon, sausage, etc. Why avoid these products? For two reasons. They're processed. Any food that's processed is a food that's been through a process other than just uh, picking and cleaning it uh, and cooking it. Those, those are processes, but the processed foods are foods that are processed where the vital elements are removed or destroyed. Vitamins, minerals, enzymes, and natural fiber. Freezing and cooking, for example, destroy enzyme. Milling grain into refined flour removes the bran and therefore the vitamins and the fiber. Refining sugar removes every trace of mineral and vitamin content, so there's nothing left but a product that cannot be classified as a food. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of having sugar cane. That's really different. Um, and one time we went to, uh, I'm trying to think if it was, uh, it must have been Africa, uh, but also Antigua Barbuda. We had, uh, we got invited to someone's house and she cooked us a uh, homemade meal and there was a piece of sugar cane uh, on the side and um, we learned how to eat that. In an effort to make up for these losses, processors add vitamins and minerals, but they don't compare to those they removed and they can't add enzymes since they are too perishable. Second, processed foods contain additives, basically anything that's been packaged, almost anything, there's some things not so much. Um, Second, processed foods contain additives, pre preservatives, emulsifiers, colorings, and flavorings. I dislike getting shredded cheese that has a mold inhibitor in it because I don't know what that is. Um, maybe it's something natural, I don't know. But I'd rather get a block of cheese and shred it myself on the cheese grater. Additives are harmful to the body and cause a variety of ailments. Food coloring, for example, can cause hypersensitivity in children. If foods are labeled natural, don't be fooled. Food processors use this term with an intent to deceive. Carefully read all labels to avoid being poisoned. Salt. Use only small quantities. Well, I believe in salt and I use the uh, the product called real salt. Looks kind of like sand. It's got all the minerals in it. And also there are other good salts out there. Um, and uh, I believe the pink salt too. Uh, poison sprays. Avoid fruits and vegetables which have been sprayed with pesticides while growing or treated with chemicals after being picked to preserve freshness. Chemical fertilizers. This was long before uh, it was known. Uh, the big fertilizer company. Uh, chemical fertilizers. Avoid, avoid buying fresh foods grown in chemically fertilized soil. Such chemicals are destroying our topsoil encouraging plagues of insects and in producing fruits and vegetables which are high in yield but deficient in essential vitamins, minerals, enzymes, and trace minerals. Okay, 
So that was unpleasant. So let's do let's go on here. It gets better. <laughs> Get enough sleep. Probably what reading this will do for you is it'll make you run uh run to the store and get yourself a bouquet that you can split up and put around the house. Just use jelly jars or some short little glass that you have. Uh you'll have you'll just need to cut them and split them all up. And you also want to go to the fresh fruit and vegetable section of your grocery store. And uh and go to the fresh uh the fresh meats and seafood. Get enough sleep. This is so this is so important and most people agonize over it because if you wake up in the night and you, you can't get back to sleep, it is a worry, isn't it? It it's you probably feel cold and um you really don't have the energy to actually get up and uh, and do something and um uh, my solution was just to stop fighting it, get up and start my day. And um, to be assured of getting enough sleep, set a specific time to go to bed. If you find it hard to get to bed on time, it is because you have is it because you have too much to do? If so, ask yourself if the things you must do are more important than sleep or your health. This may require a re review of your priorities. Now everybody's complaining about uh, screen time and how that affects your sleep, and yes, it does. But I will have to tell you that even back in the day, uh, even back in the olden days. People had sleep problems, especially as they got more vital, had sleep problems. And um, so, so for sleep to be the most restful, avoid eating after 6 p.m. Go to bed before 10 p.m. and sleep on a good firm mattress. The hours of sleep before midnight are more restful than those after. Why this is, I don't think anyone knows, but experience has proven this to be true. If you get uh, more vital and you start wanting to go to bed at 7, go ahead and do that. and uh, You will get the best rest. And also, it goes along with um, um, intermittent fasting. Because if you go to bed really early, you're not going to eat between 7 and midnight like most people do. And you won't be eating again until 7 the, the next morning. So you've got quite a good span amount of time uh, to fast or, you know, that's natural fasting. And uh, so I would say, you know, if you want to go to bed early, find a place in your house where you can do that without being disturbed. And uh, if your sleep habits seem to be changing, and also if you do not get enough sleep or you're waking up and you're not able to get back to sleep, absolutely don't worry about it. Just get up and do something you want to do. Watch a movie, sew something, arrange a room, uh, take a hot bath, listen to a movie, listen to a, a book being read, something like that, and just don't let it worry you. Nobody's going to stay as awake forever. Number three, exercise regularly. And, and also I would say about sleep, if you follow the previous advice about getting rid of additives out of your diet, and that would include additives that, in, that anything that you are connected with in any way that's, that's in your body or connected to your body at all com that has to do with chemicals that are not natural um, and additives and things like that and uh, clear down to your soaps and also your uh, the fabric on your beds, make sure you have cotton sheets or linen sheets or whatever. Um, I went through and redid everything in my house. It took a long time because it's not it's not cheap and it's hard to find some things. Uh, and redid all the, put all natural things in. It took many years to get it that way. But uh, that's a start. And at least what you're sleeping on, make sure that that is pure stuff and that you don't use uh, detergents and softeners on them because that may be it's toxic that stuff is toxic and uh, they say that someone told me that when they went camping camping they'd take one of those dryer sheets and they'd rub it all over their hair and and their clothes and stuff and it kept the mosquitoes away well that just shows you how toxic it is <laughs> it's like a uh, an insecticide so um, rinse everything in vinegar in your machine or wash it in vinegar you don't need those detergents they do just the vinegar does just as good a job once it dries it you cannot smell the vinegar so and it's more natural and you'll save tons of money and then you'll have money for that special little decorative pillow you wanted or something else 
So ex exercise regularly. Now, I don't like the word exercise. I don't like to exercise. So I just say, just get up, take a deep breath, and start walking around your house. That's good enough. That's something. Um, exercise is, um, is as important as the food we eat in producing good health and preserving life. You may feel you get enough exercise by walking about the house, bending or reaching. The problem is these motions don't invigorate the heart or bloodstream, nor bring into play all of the muscles. This is true, and also in homemaking, almost everything you do is leaning forward from the front. You hardly ever get to reach back or stretch, and that's one of the reasons I like the uh, Fabulous 50s exercise. She often has ones where you step back, or you reach back, or you roll your shoulders back and this is really important and if you have children little children at home do an exercise program together as part of your home school curriculum just find something that you can watch and copy or uh, a book that has the illustrations in it and uh, get in a room with your children and do your morning exercises I have a little uh, grandson he's five and he saw me doing exercises online he said Mima, you don't need Google. I'll I'll do your exercises for you. And he became my teacher. And he would twist and bend and jump and run. And I would just try to follow him. I mean, he's in such good shape. I, why wouldn't you want to follow a teacher like that? They, they um, live what they preach. So he has since helped his mother uh, and his family at least to stop and do some exercises. Even if they're not perfect, at least they're stopping what they're doing. And they're doing his exercise and you know children they're so uh, nimble and they're so uh, flexible and it's kind of nice so I wish you could all experience that <laughs> exercise should do two things first it should be vigorous enough and sustained enough to raise the heartbeat and maintain it for 30 or 40 minutes this stimulates the cardiovascular system strengthens the heart and brings oxygen into the bloodstream when such exercise is maintained regularly for six months or longer, it lowers the pulse or blood pressure, thus improving and ensuring health. Second, exercise, and here's the problem with any allopathic medication people give you, uh, the, the, uh, the medical department gives you, it, it makes the numbers look good, and it may lower everything in the numbers, but it doesn't correct the health. Um, so you want to work on that, correcting, actually correcting the problem. <clears throat> Second, exercise should involve as many muscles as possible to both strengthen them and limber them. Yes, that's what I like about some of the exercise programs I've recommended to you from YouTube, is that uh, they, uh, they will have some that will uh, exercise the waist, the waistline other things the shoulders other times back and they'll call it back fat eliminating back fat and they will have uh, just different parts of your body that exercise there was one lady that actually did wrist exercises that's good and there's facial exercises too some good forms of exercise Uh, it says, when such exercise is maintained regularly for six months or longer, it lowers the pulse or blood pressure, thus improving and ensuring health. Second, exercise should involve as many muscles as possible to both strengthen them and limber them. Some good forms of exercise are gymnastics, aerobics, calisthenics, bicycling, weightlifting, swimming, very brisk walking, and running. She's obviously written this to young women. <laughs> to include all of the muscles, however, some must be combined. So, yes, we can do that as we are vital, but you can do it in a small way. And some of the, uh, especially the, the lady, Shelly, at Fabulous 50s, she will uh, have a chair exercise, and you have to pretend you're running. And you get the same uh, movements, the same exercise. Or she'll have a, a type of, uh, there's another one that I follow that has a type of swimming exercise, but you're not swimming, you're just sitting down. And uh, so she, they're using the, um, the principles of it for, for their exercise. What are the rewards of exercise? When you exercise vigorously and regularly, you require less sleep, feel less hungry. That is true. You, you don't feel less hungry, but you feel less inclined uh, for cheap food or sweets. Uh, you're in better health and you feel better. 
And what I would do is just turn off their music and turn on something on your phone you want to listen to, hymns or something like that, or uh, Bible being read. And uh, just do your exercises that way in a pleasant atmosphere. Uh, bring in your bouquet of flowers and uh, if you've got one of those uh, if you've got one of those battery operated candles just make the atmosphere really nice in the room in which you are exercising it make it a uh, kind of a relaxing spiritual place and not just a grueling job that must be done number four drink plenty of water pure water she says and she explains uh, how much water to drink per weight I don't want to encourage people to drink too much um, so she says if you don't drink enough water your body is forced to use its own water over and over again and uh, the water thing is something people are kind of looking into and studying get plenty of fresh air I love this one this is the one that health people often miss out on and overweight people that concentrate only on diet and food miss out on this and how much it contributes to your overall health a good supply of air fresh air consists of three things first the air should be fresh so it has an ample oxygen content that's why I object objected to the MASKS's second it should have sufficient moisture content that's why I objected to uh, to face coverings uh, that, that's not good. Third, breathe deeply so you can take sufficient oxygen into your lungs. You can't do that if you have a face covering. Oxygen is most is our most important food. What good food is to the stomach, oxygen is to the blood. Now you think about that for a while. That's the food for your blood, oxygen. So we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide. And I believe that the plants uh, produce oxygen. It's just also amazing how it how it circulates and interacts and how God made it to work to be that way. To be assured of enough oxygen, see that fresh air circulates in your rooms. If it's uncomfortable for other people to have uh, cold fresh air, I close the door of that room after I've cleaned it or while I'm cleaning it and uh, open the windows and that way you know it doesn't make other people really cold. You get elderly people or little kids you don't want them to get too cold um, and it's the same you know if, if you're in a, during a heat wave you might want to close that window <laughs> close that door and open the windows keep your posture to uh, use that fresh air see that fresh air circulates in your rooms keep your posture erect and your breathing is deep rather than shallow so you breathe through your stomach I believe or you you breathe down here and uh, and avoid getting stuck up here um, that's like the panic breathing you know he clutched his throat <laughs> um, keep your posture erect and your deep so that your breathing is deep rather than shallow increase your oxygen intake by exercise the moisture content of the air is very important to health especially in preventing illness of the respiratory system such as cold sore throat and bronchitis most modern heating systems dry the air. That's why I say you're better off at home. You can regulate it all yourself. Don't go to work for uh, a commercial enterprise or an office or an employer. You have no control over the indoor environment in those places. Uh, you're healthier at home. Most modern heating systems dry the air so that even in a moist climate, the air in the house is dry. To solve this problem, have a moisturizer installed in your furnace, use a humidifier, or hang wet towels in rooms which are occupied. At night, if the weather permits, turn off the furnace and open the windows. Here's another really good one here. Relax at work or play. Relaxation promotes health and charm, whereas tension deters it. While work, doing work which makes you tense, how can you make yourself relax? by controlling your thoughts. The mind controls the body, making it tense or relax. Isn't that the truth? You have something on your mind and then you start to feel it clutch your throat and then your chest gets tight and then your lower back hurts, your lower back and your upper back and, and pretty soon you're good for nothing. You just want to collapse. So you've got to keep your mind on things that are good. 
When you merely tell your body to relax, you immediately feel a relief of tension. Additional things which help you relax are exercise and good mental attitude. So now she has uh, her one of her last one here, have a healthy mental attitude. The Bible talks about the mind so much uh, because God knows that uh, if the mind can be controlled, then our act- activities and our actions and our lives can be controlled. Wholesome attitudes arrive from virtues such as faith, hope, optimism, love, kindness, cheerfulness, and sympathy, forgiveness, and enthusiasm. You can practice this if you're raising children. Get them to love each other and to forgive each other and to have patience with one another. I always uh, praise them for that uh, and to and to really want to protect one another and defend one another. These pleasant attitudes harmonize with body functions and invigorate the system, promoting good health. In contrast, unwholesome attitudes arise from defects of character, such as worry, fear, anxiety, pessimism, hate, resentments, impatience, envy, or anger. How many of you have known people who most of their lives have complained about their bad lot in life? They didn't get a chance. They didn't get... uh, the money that was uh, supposed to be given to them on the inheritance they and of course i'm not saying uh i'm not saying yes to unfairness no but what a uh, bad health those people are in to this day because they resent someone they they have so much resentment and they'll tell you the same story over and over about uh, how they were mistreated they were treated unfairly and they can't they can't function now uh but i read somewhere uh some health book that the body was designed to renew itself and recover and so was the mind interesting isn't it um that the the cells and everything just reproduce and you get new ones all the time just think today you're brand new you don't have the same body you had yesterday <laughs> um In contrast, unwholesome attitudes arise from defects of character, such as worry, fear, anxiety, pessimism, hate, resentment. You know, in the beginning of her book, uh, Helen Andelin wrote that if you're going to succeed in in these principles here, these character principles, you have to put away worry and anxiety. You just have to let go of it. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, she 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 stated it in such a way that it was almost shocking, and the most of the people in the class would be thinking, "What?" Because the teacher said, "You're going to have to give up some things if you want a happy marriage and a happy home life. There's some things you have to give up." And everybody's kind of looking at each other, and the things you had to give up were worry, fear, anxiety, pessimism, hate, resentments, impatience, envy, or anger. Any so if you've got a uh, someone in your family that is all this that has all this those are the things they need to give up it's got nothing to do with their circumstances they just have to give up all this stuff any negative mental attitude has a detrimental effect on the health its destructive influence is carried through the nervous system to the entire body that's why when we get tense we reach for something that uh, to eat or put in our mouth that we shouldn't have um, people have been known to die of extreme fear or rage you remember the man in uh, in the Bible who was the husband of I'm trying to think of the, the woman who's whose husband was so angry because David was uh, going to take his flocks through his land uh, and he he was so angry and threw, pitched such a fit that he uh, had a heart attack and died. His name was Nabal and I believe uh, her name was Abigail and uh, she, uh, so there he died of extreme rage and fear. So let's talk about uh, this again another time because I've already been here over an hour and I think I've probably given you way too much to think about. And so, ladies, um, you're welcome to leave a comment on the blog. I don't have any on the channel. And I really appreciate you coming here. And I hope that you do well today in your home and that you 
that you are happy and that you are productive and that you can rest a lot and that you'll stay close to Christ. I'll talk to you later. Bye.